Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of the Analytic Mind podcast. I've uh, been really enjoying um, getting back into podcasting and I've got a really awesome guest, George Mount, here with us today. Uh, George is um, one of our one of our um, awesome partners and trainers um, at Enterprise DNA, but also does a lot of his own stuff and has had a, a really varied um, career up to this date in the analytics space. So really keen to dive into a lot of that and a lot of the experiences he's had, a lot of the trends. Um, but George, why don't I just throw it over to you first? Maybe you can just give a, a bit more of a background about yourself um, and um, how you've got to uh, where you are today. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh always enjoy speaking and uh, partnering with, with the enterprise DNA community. Um, so I have been in analytics for uh, over 10 years now and started out kind of in the spreadsheet minds, like a lot of people. Uh, it really just got me interested in thinking about how much data people use. And I'm not talking about data scientists, just you know, regular financial analysts, accountants, whomever. And what we can do to make that better for them, for the business, and so forth. And what we're missing uh, in usual training programs, whether it's traditional or non-traditional education, uh, to improve that. So that's really what I've started to dig into. Uh, I have a somewhat technical background myself in uh, stats and analytics and things like that. So I dig into that to some extent, but again, um, it's really about, you know, helping just kind of the, the common analysts, right. Get more technical and more sophisticated with how they work with data. And when, when did you start, um, seeing big trends in this particular area, like where this was becoming, uh, a more, um, relevant uh, career path, uh, but also more relevant within businesses, like actually you know, making a difference within businesses. Yeah, it's interesting. So I remember posting something a few months ago about the analyst toolkit 10 years ago for a lot of people really began and ended with Excel. And sure, we had things like uh, access, uh, maybe you did stuff with SQL Server, um, but it, it was kind of a closed shop and there weren't a lot of, a lot of alternatives. Um, whereas today now, right. Some of us are working with R and Python, although those tools existed before they weren't as accessible. There weren't things like R studio. Um, there are so many more options, let alone inside of Excel, right. Things like power query, um, and power pivot, obviously power BI. Um, but even putting aside the, the tools uh, in the last couple of years, seeing big corporations, right? And I'm thinking places like Mercedes-Benz, Chick-fil-A, I mean, really well-respected companies uh, developing internal data literacy programs, right? The, the research is being done that people aren't comfortable working with data and we can kind of quantify, use the data to explain what data literacy does or data illiteracy does and why it's worth, right? Fixing that, bridging that gap. Uh, so, so those two trends have uh, somewhat moved in the same direction. Um, and now we're in an interesting place to try to make sense of all those things. There's still so much more to go. So for, you know, we can think about, okay, like Mercedes Benz, great we don't all work there. Think of all the funneling down that that still needs to do, right? All just the kind of uh, average Joe accountancies, right? All the finest, even in, even in the companies that have it, right? It takes time. We know that in business, right? Things tend to take a while for people to get to full adoption. Um, yeah. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in data literacy and power BI and whatever tools, I mean, it's such a cool opportunity that you're going to be really able to ride this wave probably for like your whole career. Uh, so yeah, well, welcome aboard. Yeah, that's such, that's such a good um, point. And something that I truly believe in as well is that um, we're still like just in the infancy of Power, Power BI. Like, you know, that's that's obviously our focus at Enterprise DNA. Um, Power BI has only really been around for six years, even though it was some tools before that, but um, really only been around for six years. But I mean, there's a 20 year runway on Power BI. Like, there's no doubt in my mind just because of how core it is to the 
sort of enterprise suite um, or, or even sort of the, the medium-sized business suite of Microsoft's toolings. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's just so much potential, just so much opportunity. Um, and, and I think you're alluding to, to sort of the same thing. I'm really interested to pick up on, on some of the things you mentioned because I know you've written some books on, um, on like Microsoft Excel and, and R and, um, and, a few, and, and maybe a few others. I, I can't actually remember how many books you've written. Maybe you, can, maybe you can let us know. But I also want to dive into the data literacy aspect because I know you're a bit of an expert on, um, on, your, uh, on some insights there. You know, you've, you've got some good insights around, you know, what makes um, an individual more data literate, but also so an organization more data literate. So, so first of all, so the t- I guess that's a two-part question is um, maybe dive into some of the books and, and the insights that you got from writing some of your books, uh, but also, you know, some, some more on that, that data literacy um, trend that you have seen. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so um, I started blogging probably 2014 or something like that. Uh, always enjoyed to write. And felt like I wasn't getting enough opportunity to do that in my corporate job. So it wasn't even explicitly meant to be an Excel blog at the beginning, but speaking of being a data analyst, yeah, I kind of noticed that those tended to get more engagement, right? So I went went with that. And uh, that culminated in a book uh, with O'Reilly, which I thought I had, but I don't see it. Advancing in analytics, I'm sure you can find it's somewhere. Um, and that book is, I wish I knew where it was. That's okay. Um, it's about getting into tools like Python and R, as you talked about as an Excel user, um, working on another one, right. Uh, another book, uh, kind of in the same vein, a little more introductory based on, uh, data analysis and Excel. So Excel is very much my, my home base, um, as it is for a lot of, a lot of users, uh, still, um, yeah, if you enjoy to write, uh, if you want to uh, build the community, um, obviously, you know, I don't think anybody's getting rich. I think Brian Julius at Enterprise DNA uh, jokes that right nobody nobody's built their their lake house on uh, on Tahoe with uh, the funds from a technical book. So uh, that that's not necessarily the 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 way to approach it, but it is a great way if you're looking for community recognition, whether that's an MVP whether that's clients, it's a very, and yet again, we spoke about, you know, thinking about your career in total and knowing that this wave is just going to keep going. A book is, is one of those seeds that you plant expecting a harvest kind of a long way away. Um, so, so that's been great. And, you know, to bridge that to data literacy, it's kind of the same with the organizations, right? Planning that data literacy uh, seed is going to take some time because it is, it's, and I've, I wrote a post about this a while back um, on change management and data literacy. I mean, it, it really is like a change management process and, and you have to go through the steps. You have to expect that it's going to take some time. Um, and there are things that you can do to make it more successful. Um, but one of the things that you, you can't force is an accelerated timeline. And, and how do you... Um... You know, I'm, 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 I've recently become quite fascinated with data literacy. So I'm interested to just maybe riff on this a little bit and just get your insights. How do you, you know, data literacy is a very broad concept. How do you actually quantify this? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of businesses, there's a lot of managers who are thinking, oh, we need to get more data literacy, literate. But how do you actually quantify um, going from one one place where you are now to to um, you know more excellence around data literacy, like how do you assess it, and then how do you think you can um, improve it? Yeah, so as far as the the measurement, um, you know, one one of the things you can do is just assess the the competencies and the skills that um, your team has going in to the program and coming out. You know, ideally, you're going to have a richer net of uh, different individuals, different uh, departments having a, a better rounded uh, skill set. Uh, also, you know, obviously, with with things being data, uh, there's a lot of cleaning that needs to be done. There's a lot of time spent making sense of the data, um, getting it to a ship state, and and so forth. And 
um, those are pretty easily quantified. So, you know, like being able on the, on that kind of cost side to say, you know, Hey, we took a process and this really is almost, this is the other thing is that the idea of data literacy and then the more kind of general digital literacy, um, and getting into automation, right? Like they really dovetail nicely. Uh, so there's that kind of cost side of things. Um, ideally you're able to start, you know, seeing how it directly impacts revenue, um, right. You're able to offer better services, um, more, uh, relevant plans and things like that to, to customers that could take a little bit while, uh, longer. Um, but yeah, really, really it's about, and ideally you're going to see talking, thinking about great resignation, right. And people leaving work. I mean, that's, has, that has very real cost in a lot of ways, organizations and, uh, ideally you'll see that, uh, a, a workforce that you, uh, are in it for the long haul with, they would reciprocate that in some way with uh, things like a data literacy program. So a lot of, a lot of different uh, ways to, to go about trying to measure that, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And, and what have you, like, what, what would you um, say makes a really data literate company? Like, can you think of a gold standard? Like, is it is it um, something that you just can test with knowledge or is it something that you think needs some really successful deployment of a technology like a Power BI or a Tableau? Like, can you have one without the other um, or do they need to work in parallel to really say, okay, we are, we have changed our um, data literacy culture. Yeah, that's a good one. So, um, you know, often people really emphasize that uh, you need to lead on, on the, the people, right? And and there's no such thing as uh, just dumping money into a tool and that may, means your team is data literate. Um, on the other hand, you can invest incorrectly in people. And I'm thinking particularly the, okay, let's hire a, a stunk work team of data scientists and they're just gonna you know, handle all of our data needs. So that doesn't go well either. Um, you know, I tend to think, right? I, I was thinking more about this recently. I mean, there's the expression, learning the tools of the trade, right? And when you're getting into a career, that's really the first thing that you do is you understand those tools. And then from there, you start to slowly understand, well, what they're used for, how can I use them? What's, what problems can I solve with? So I think that, you know, I understand why people say, you know, don't focus on on the tools and you need to solve the problem, this and that. But on the other hand, every learner has to know the tools of the trade, right? That's why we say learn the tools of the trade. Um, so, so I tend to be a little more uh, aggressive about getting that as like a pretty serious plank of, of the adoption strategy. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Like I was, I was thinking, okay, you can have a, you can have a standalone data literacy program, right? Wh which is, you know, technology agnostic, but I, I kind of feel like if you marry that with an actual real world deployment of a tool, it's going to be so much more relevant um, and more actionable straight away, right? Like if you can say measure the amount of usage of your Power BI reports based on your education of the cons consumers in your business, well, that's that's like an identifiable metric that is saying, okay, well, we're actually building our data literacy because more people are actually viewing and um, and and hopefully making decisions based on uh, the, the the reports and the dashboards that we've created. Yeah, I do, absolutely. Uh, I, I am a little snarky when I say that if the tools don't matter, then uh, pull out your slide rule and your abacus and I'll... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll use my computer and we'll we'll see who's farther ahead uh if the tools don't really matter yeah yeah that's that's yeah that's a, that's a good one that's a good point it's a good point um talk to me about your view on the evolution of excel um you know a lot a lot of even all of our listeners know that that enterprise dna is very power bi focused but but one thing that that um we 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 just cannot deny is the persistence of excel usage it has continued to be a real staple of, uh, even though Power BI is, in our view, just this amazing superior tool, Excel is still used so widely, far more widely than you would than even Power BI, even today. Um, so, what's your what's your view on the evolution of it, and and uh, what Microsoft have been doing with it? 
Yeah, yeah. So like I said, uh, even when I was coming into the workforce, right, uh, Excel, you had VBA in the back. Um, that's still there, but uh, yeah, it's still there. What ha- what wasn't there is things like uh, Power Query, Power Pivot, all those things. And, uh, you know, the way that I like to explain is that, right, Microsoft um, keeps putting, it, it, it's kind of like uh, actions speak louder than words, right? So we can say, oh, don't use Excel, Excel's dead, this and that. Um, but then you can look at uh, what people actually do with Excel. Uh, for example, Microsoft is putting a lot of money into it. Uh, almost every company uses it to some extent. So, right, we can see from the actions that there's still a lot, uh, a lot to be said uh, for the tool. Um, you know, some of the the newer things that I'm really excited about uh, Python integration. Now, that's not officially announced, not officially released, uh, but that that's looking very likely. Um, different tools to uh, even add some more kind of like AI embedded type features. Um, so that has its, has its pluses and minuses, um, but, you know, obviously, uh, helping people kind of speed that acceleration to discovering insights in the data. Uh, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. And, uh, yeah, I think it's continuously, uh, growing and, uh, it's certainly a tool that you can still proudly learn and grow a a career around. Do you feel like um, Excel users should always look to complement their their um, their skills with like a more advanced tool like Power BI or, or Tableau or, or many others that are out there? Yeah, I think so. So um, you know, when an anal- when somebody is training to become a data analyst, uh, having that Excel component is a good one. It's it's an okay base layer. Um, I don't want to call it their their home base because really they should be able to know again, like what's the right tool for the right situation. Um, so having and having uh, some knowledge of, of a BI tool is another one that, that they should know. Um, understanding databases, uh, you know, and whether that's actually coding SQL, you know, some, some people do, some people don't use SQL, but um, having that relational database know how which you kind of get from learning BI uh, tools anyway um, is important. And then, uh, depending on what you're trying to go into in terms of the industry and the title and things like that, um, I I'm very partial to I, I've always loved stats, so you know I got into Python and R. I know that not everybody uses it; they see the, they don't see the need, they don't have the opportunity. Um, but that's another thing that that I encourage analysts to do is like just try all this stuff. I mean, you're not getting married to it, right? Nobody's uh, nobody's going to check your paperwork and make sure you're in the right house right um so just try it try something all of these things have like tremendous potential um and everybody's kind of got their own style uh, you know some some people really gravitate toward one tool or another there's really no no wrong answer uh but yeah having with that being said uh there is kind of a good approach for structuring your your skill path if you're looking to get into analytics and the, the things that we just mentioned yeah, and and uh, just 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 following on from that, what well, what do you think from your experience is the way for, say, someone who's just maybe good in Excel, um, how how can they um, see the value a, in pursuing more technical languages like Python or or R? Like, what a what what's the pathway there? And then, what are some of the tangible things that you have seen have done or have seen being done, you know, with these more advanced languages in that Excel environment? Yeah. So um, first thing I would encourage um, Excel users to just start documenting anytime they encounter some kind of friction with what they're trying to do, just keep a list of of those things. Right. And uh, eventually you may even start to see some patterns Um, from there. You know, you want to think about R and Python as not even necessarily. So, you know, for better or worse, most positions as an analyst, you don't need to do a lot of statistical modeling. You don't need to build like a machine learning predictive model. That's kind of another career path. It's good to know the basics, but on an everyday level, you know, most analysts aren't doing that and that's fine. Um, 
that is not the only value that you can get from, from Python or, or R. Um, so whether it is uh, maybe there's some unusual, like unstructured data source that you, you need to work with text or something like that. Um, with R you can build and for the uh, visualization reporting uh, summit next week, I think I'm doing something on R notebook. So you can really build a, for, I mean, people build books with R, for example, you could build an entire website with, with R um, so that, that, you know, there's a lot of different non-stats applications uh, for both of those that could be, be really handy. But again, um, you know, understanding that these tools are and another way to, to frame it is they're really meant to help and support what you know in Excel or Power BI, et cetera. I mean, I always like to explain that if there wasn't some uh, use for them, um, they wouldn't be in Power BI or available for use there. Uh, Python wouldn't be coming to Excel. So that's kind of like the tacit, again, I should speak louder than words. It's kind of the tacit endorsement that, yes, you can complement your skill set. You don't have to get rid of them, but you're still going to learn something and be able to benefit from them. Yeah, I, 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 those are all really, really good points. Um, and one, one of the things that I, I, I like to just like really highlight to even Excel users that today you can automate so much more of the work that um, goes into data analysis than you ever believed, like maybe a few years ago. Like um, with Excel, you've got, you know, you've got Power Query, which can, yeah. which can automate half your work just like that. Um, you know, most of your work in Excel is just data cleaning and data wrangling, et cetera. Um, but then when you layer on um, for sort of more advanced um, statistical analysis or just, just generally more advanced analysis, you know, you can layer on some Python and R code onto that, um, either in Excel or in, um, in Power BI and, um, and, and automate just so much of your life, automate so much of your work. And, and, what, and, and, and a lot of people I've seen over the years have always seen that as maybe a threat, but, but uh, trust me, it is, it is not so much. It, is, it enables you to do five to 10 times more. That's, that's, that's really what it does. And yeah. that, is, that is only a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, honestly, that was another big reason that I was drawn into this uh, as an analyst. I figured that my job would be uh, managerial or on the business side, right? I would be speaking with uh, you know store managers, understanding the product, right? Understanding the business trends, coming up with strategies. And um, then I found, oh, wait, no, I'm actually going to be just copying and pasting in Excel. And it's too, I remember when I learned uh, how to type in school and they told us that you don't even want to process the words that you're typing, right? Because that's just going to slow you down. So just, just type and don't even think about the context. And I feel like analysts often get into that role when they're copying and pasting the Excel reports. Like they're not even thinking about what do these numbers mean? What are the, why, what's the strategy? They're just totally so bent on like, just, just get this spreadsheet out the door. So that was another big reason that I got really into this is I thought, okay, so like if I can automate this stuff, do my job efficiently, okay, then I can actually go out and understand the business, talk to the customer and deliver the actual business value. Yeah. And, and what over the years, what is, what is it been any customer engagements or, or things that you've, you've done um, that have really, um, you've, you've seen the value you've, you've, you've been like, wow, that is, that is, that is really improving a process that's really making better decisions. Like, is there some specifics, um, uh, you know, models or specific uh, implementations that you've done on something that, that you could really um, say, you know, this made a massive difference. Yeah. A lot of it has been really at the, at the individual basis and, and helping, uh, analysts who, uh, kind of understand, uh, that there's more to their job than they're being told or that they know about and, and really taking that next step, uh, uh, you know, checking out uh, resources like the book or uh, whatever tools, and then getting to that point where they're really able to uh, oversee some kind of like grassroots change uh, in their department, right? Whether they're able to automate those processes, right? I've heard people, you know, you know they have the something that takes a day and now it takes, right, a few seconds, things like that. Um, helping organizations save a lot of money just by condensing 
some process that that they really can't uh, describe in terms of data, but showing that showing them that lens of data literacy that like okay, well we can actually kind of break this down into right variables. We can think of this as a basic model, and based on this model, uh, we can come up with with uh, with savings or. Uh, increased productivity or things like that. So, you know, I think optimization is one that, that I've used in, in a lot of different settings, um, whether that's like retail, healthcare, diff different places that um, I think is a really nice way in because uh, often it, it comes with like a pretty significant uh, increase in business operations. And it really starts to get people thinking uh, about um, why data literacy is, is really so important. What are, what are the, some of the traits that you're seeing from individuals within businesses um, that you see are, are most aligned to um, being improving their data literacy or, or, or improving their, their data analyst skills? Like what, what, are, what are the personal traits that, that you think are um, most aligned to that? Yeah. Um, I would say that um, having that um, almost art of the possible kind of uh, mentality where even if being, being okay with the ambiguity where, okay, so you think that, so, so Wordle is a good example. And I actually sent this out in a newsletter uh, a couple days ago that when I saw Wordle get popular, it was like the first thing that I thought, you know, okay, that would be such a cool optimization problem. So you get about optimization. Um, and, you know, I didn't really get into building it, but I saw people in a lot of different tools. I, you know, I think I saw an Excel meetup are, I mean, a lot of people ended up building Wordle tools in uh, their, their tool of choice. And uh, so just having that, uh, that intuition and being okay with, okay, well, I don't know how to do this right now, but if I really had to, I could figure it out, right? And knowing, okay, having the resourcefulness where, it, okay, if I need to figure it out, what are the steps, right? Like, how can I, how can I unblock myself? Um, where, if, if I'm stuck, how do I ask the right questions? Um, I see that, uh, you know, a lot of analysts need that coaching where um, something, something breaks and it's just like, okay, that didn't work. Right. So getting, getting to the point where it's actually, okay, knowing, I mean, it seems, it sounds so stupid, but like learning how to take a good screenshot, right. Coming up with a data set that you can share and a really tiny example that boils your, right. So being able to like take a situation and just boil it down into those smaller components. Um, but like I said, just not being, being comfortable with, uh, knowing that there's a better way, but not knowing how to do it yet, but you know, you can get there. Yeah. Uh, another way that I think I would, I would um, term that as sort of like the inquisitive mind. Like, yeah. like, I, I feel like, Oh, I, I guess, you know, that is almost like the analytic mind. That's why we named it the podcast. Yeah. Right? It's like the yeah. inquisitive mind, someone who um, can see um, a problem or, or can see uh, that, you know, there's there's a value add proposition in optimizing a process or um, deep diving deeper into the data, building building some some sort of analytical application that will 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 solve will make us um, enable better decision making. You know that that inquisitive mind, I think, is 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 a is a really strong trait for someone to naturally evolve their data um, analysis and data literacy skills um, and 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 really build out a career in this space. Um, one of the things you mentioned, you, you've got a newsletter. And so how do you how do you find writing out your newsletter is for your general thought process in this particular space? Like, do you find that actually writing it out, writing it down um, is just so good for you to uh, solidify in your mind, you know, what your current thought thoughts are about a particular, you know, part of the, the data um, universe? Uh, yeah, I've uh, joked with Brian on this too, that it's, there's nothing better than searching something online and finding your own post to show you how to do something that you're trying to do. Um, <laughs> right. really so yeah, it, it, it is, it, it's, 
you know, this idea of, of open source, right. And open sourcing your mind, open sourcing your processes, it, it just makes everybody more comfortable, you know, whether that's an employer, a client yourself, that when you come to a problem, uh, you, you have a set of steps, right? Like you're just not just shotgunning things and trying it out. And if it doesn't work, then you're just kind of one of these, Oh, all right, never mind. Um, so you're, you're really able to, uh, take things through from one point to the next point really thoroughly and systematically. Um, I really love to write. So, you know, like a newsletter or book and things like that, things like that are good for me. Uh, I make a lot of memes as well. That's part of one of my newsletters. I send out a meme uh, every, every time I do. Um, and it's just a lot of trial and error as well. So, you know, you have to find what works, what you like, right? Um, that's another great opportunity for, for data analysis as well, right? To figure out what your audience is, is engaging with and uh, try to meet, meet them uh, along with, with what you're personally interested in, in doing. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I would certainly encourage anybody uh, and going to that idea of, um, you know, typically there's a lot of fear about automation. There's also a lot of fear about uh, sharing, sharing your, your knowledge, but, mm -hmm. but really the, the more knowledge that you can share uh, that always is, is a great, great tool and method for, for you to grow and, and advance your career. Yeah. How many, how many, do, how many um, people do you send your newsletter out to these days? Uh, it's a couple thousand right now. Wow. That's cool. And what do you think over time, over the years has been, the best strategy you've pursued to build your own personal profile in the, in the um, online space? Uh, it changes very frequently. I, like I said, started with Excel and just, it, I didn't even, if you go to my early pages on the blog, it, a lot of the posts don't have anything to do with Excel. They were mostly, you know, like general business analytics and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, I, I kind of pivoted into Excel. Um, and then I got really into R and Python because I was in a graduate program where I, where I needed to use them. Um, so, you know, to a certain extent, you should, and one way somebody's explained this to me is, okay, well, you need to be having some fun with something like a blog or your thought leadership or, you know, solo producership, whatever you want to call it. Otherwise, if it's just totally a chore, and just get a job because then you get a paycheck and everything's take, taken care of for you. So you need to have some fun. But on the other hand, uh, you don't want to have too much fun because then it's not a business either. So there's kind of a you know continuum there. You have to find that optimal point. Um, and for me, it's taken it's taken some trial and error. I mean, there are even things like the newsletter. Um, I was sending it out every week, and I was looking at where I was getting my leads. And I was really seeing kind of a disconnect between where my leads are coming from and what my newsletter is doing. So that, you know, that's been some, some recalibration for how can I, you know, mesh those uh, together better. So um, on the other hand, you know, you, you want to make sure that things uh, that you see things out and don't give up too soon, right? How soon is too soon? Does anybody really know? Um, but yeah, having that analytic mind again, you know, helps me um, from a business perspective as well, just knowing uh, how to design my marketing and, and branding and all that stuff as well. What do you think is in, in um, your own personal future in this space? Do you feel like you've got um, some more evolutions in, in, in what you might do personally? <laughs> Yeah. So right now it's just, uh, me independently. Uh, I don't see a lot of, uh, changes with that, but I'll never say never. Uh, like I said, there's so much going on in the field of, of data literacy and, uh, you know, adopting, helping analysts really build out their, their technical skill set and also just their, their mindset, right? Like again, analytic mind, re really being able to think about things like mathematics and statistical thinking, not just as a bunch of equations and Greek symbols and all that stuff, but really looking, thinking about it as, as a way of thinking. So I'd love to get more into, into that. Um, like I've said a few times, uh, I really enjoy writing, so I'll probably continue with the books, but uh, 
like we said, it's, it's such a, a growing and, and evolving field. So I'm sure I'll, I'll find uh, the space within it and, and continue to, to grow with it as I hope much of the audience will as, as well. Yeah. And just on, on top of that, you are uh, also partnered with us um, as part of the, the training team as well, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Um, do you have a program, like, do you have a set program already around data literacy that you are um, sort of working with, with, with customers um, uh, right now on, or is that, is that some, something that you um, want to, want to, want to get into in the future? Yeah, that is that is a long term goal. I've worked with a couple organizations on on building theirs out. Um, I would love to get into a more structured, almost licensed kind of approach, but but that's uh, something that that's a goal. Uh, so we'll see where things head there too. Mm. And do you have like what uh, a set? Um, um, assessment or a set program would be around data literacy like what are what are some of the ideas that that you have got that would be um seen as uh, high value within an organization in that particular topic yeah so when any whenever somebody subscribes to my my newsletter i do send them again speaking of this open source idea they will get sent a repo with, which I call my my learning library. So that has different workshop outlines, demos, assessments, really anything that if if you were tasked or if you wanted to try to build some kind of a, a of a data literacy program, that you could use all those kind of raw materials in in helping build that out. Um, I tend to focus more on the my as we've talked about the the persona i'm usually focused on is someone with kind of moderate analytic skills already you know they may have analyst in their title but maybe it's something like operations or marketing or they just want to advance their technical skills a little bit more um i mean really a true data literacy program is really in a lot of ways bigger than that helping everybody in the organization whether that's the executive the frontline staff uh, build build those skills. So so I tend to have a bit of a niche in there. Uh, but like I said, uh, I I do have quite a few assets that that people are free to use however they however they want in uh, building that that program out. Cool, cool. And um, what are some of the things that you're most excited about in this space? Like looking out sort of five to ten years. Like what do you what do you think are going to be the big um, things that are going to um, improve the the data analysts uh, individually, but also organizations in the in the data space. Like, what are some of the massive, the like really big trends, the real big um, needle movers in this space um, that that you think people will be looking back on in ten years' time, going, "Wow, that was that was quite transformational." Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, we're we're getting more more to a point where uh data is really being given the treatment that it needs to in in organizations that it it's not going to be an uphill fight to try to get r installed and that's you know like a little example on a bigger scale we're going to have systems in place where uh like I've been, in, I've had jobs myself where uh, basically the, it's the, you know, those movies where somebody's getting audited and they open the closet and all the, <laughs> the paperwork falls out, right? They, okay, go make sense of this, go audit it. I feel like so many analysts, that's what they walk into, right? They walk into the closet with just the papers falling out. And, and I really feel like we're getting to a place where for a lot of reasons, organizations are thinking, okay, we, we can't have that anymore. Like we need to build the systems so that people can walk onto the job and, okay, yeah, there, there's always going to be data cleaning, right? I mean, I say that it's uh, it's like money, right? Clean data doesn't just fall on trees. So there's always going to be some some of that, but, but it, it shouldn't be to the point where, like I said, you're more focused on kind of processing itself, on the processing itself, more so than the business of the, the values and really uh, relating it back to the business. So, so that's kind of a really big picture trend, how we get there. There's some, you know, ways that that's going to happen, but I think a lot of the processes and tools and, and, and development programs that we've talked about are going to be a big, 
big step forward for that. Mm, yeah, no, that's interesting. My, my two keywords that stand out, um, uh, f- you know, for me, um, in, that we'll be looking at back on is is automation and immer- immersion. Those are my two big ones, my two key themes, because I think that all up and down the stack of of the, the data stack, right, like from where you source the data, manage it, store it, clean it, transform it, analyze it, visualize it. Up and down that stack, I think there's just going to be automation after automation after automation. So I think that's really super exciting. And then also automation in terms of finding insights, creating reports. Like I think, you know, it's natural language, AI. I think I think all of these little, there'll be like little, little things that get automated uh, step by step. And then eventually you'll be like, oh, wow, okay, I can just like write something in and then I'm going to get this entire dashboard, you know, report on, on that insight. Um, so that's, that's, that's my big one. And then the other big one is immersion. I just think that once all this automation takes place, the way that it is displayed is just going to be so, it's just going to be immersive. You're going to have it on your phone. You're going to have your, on your iPad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it already is there. Like it is already there. Um, but it's just going to be in every piece of software. It's going to be in, in Outlook. It's going to be in Microsoft Teams. I mean, I mean, even some of that stuff is happening now, but it's still not, not, it's not immersive as it will be. That's, that's, that's what I think. So those are my two key things. I'm interested to know what you think about that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's really so much more that can be done uh, with, with that immersion element, right? And really thinking of data as, as that product. Uh, you know, we're so used to using products now across devices, uh, across channels, right? And, and we're going to do a place where uh, those data products are going to be used in in a similar fashion. So so that'll be exciting to see as well. Like the the other thing I think is 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 not very far off is that um you know there, there'll be immersion in terms of someone might speak to you they they might analyze it in natural language for you. So you 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 know you might not even have to create the report like you might be able to ask a question and then they'll be able to look through the data and answer it. Um, you might have to do a bit of backup um, um, set up in the background, obviously, for a lot of that stuff. But but I I, I actually don't even think that's far away. Like it is, it is like just around the corner because we that's know right. how much you can automate right now once you build out like a high quality implementation of Power BI. And so really, it's all about building some sort of bot that can look at the analysis that is already being done and read from the screen. And that's really it. And then, and, and I've seen that being done in pockets, like, you know, in, in, in areas around um, the digital world already. So like, it's right. really, really not that far away, which is super exciting. Yeah. Um, and the yeah. fact that it's not very far away, you just think about the iterations that we could get to in, um, you know, in five to 10 years, it's going to be pretty amazing. So is there any, just to round off, what, uh, is there any sort of final thoughts? Is there any final insights that you've got, um, you know, may, maybe from a, an individual perspective, like um, what, what, what do you think are some of the, you know, um, key things that someone could be doing now? I mean, maybe this could apply to a business as well. Like right now, like what are some of the key things that, that could really make a difference to this data culture, this data literacy aspect um, uh, of an individual or a business? Yeah, so I think we're seeing more data users, not fewer, right? The idea that we will just hire a bunch of PhDs and they're going to take care of all of our data needs, that didn't work out so well. So we're we're going to need we're going to need all the help that we can get. And what that means is that anyone who expresses the interest in this, we should embrace them wholeheartedly, whether that means we've talked about sharing the knowledge that we have, uh, letting uh, people learn more about about what we do, open sourcing these processes, automating things so that people can focus on the business. I think that a lot of those trends are are going to be uh, increasingly important. So having that kind of big tent mentality, whether it comes to the data and where it's used or the people who are using it, uh, I think is going to be really, really important. Cool. Yeah, no, some some really good final uh, final thoughts there. Well, um, why don't we why don't we why don't we wrap up, um, George? Thanks thanks for all of your insights and um, and ideas around um, around how people can can really uh, make a difference in this particular space. Really really appreciate it, and uh, again, really appreciate your collaboration with with Enterprise DNA. Um, really enjoyed watching a lot of your videos and, and your coursework that you've put into the platform, and um, looking forward to partnering on 
on some uh, exciting initiatives in the future. One of those being um, our, our accelerator programs, which I I think is going to be um, you know something quite unique. You know, really talking about modern Excel and and some of the some of the new aspects um, or some of the new you know things that can be done in Excel that a lot of people probably aren't even aware of. Yes, and and for all of the harping I've done on the importance of uh, community and, and all that, uh, Sam already knows those things. So want to want to give the shout out there for everything that that he's doing too. Cool, man. Thanks. Okay, well let's wrap up. Thank you everyone for um for tuning in. Um, please don't uh, forget to subscribe on all your uh, listening channels. Um, and yeah, watch out for more content uh, in the near future on the Analytic Mind and uh, and from me and Enterprise DNA. Okay, thanks all.